Okay. And uh, this is, I got to do the introduction again. Um, what are we doing again? This is, this is Oasis chat number three from the Trans Apocalyptic Oasis. I am Marshall Eon, and this is Tom Warner. Thanks for having me on. No, thanks for joining me. Um, so you were, I'm, I'm really curious what, about what you were just saying about having an obsessive personality. What does that mean to you? Um, so I think, uh, I think it's, uh, a dog with a bone, I suppose, to some, to some extent, uh, you have to chew it until you're satisfied that you've chewed it enough. Um, I suppose it's a kind of compulsion in a way sometimes, maybe it's not always, um, but there are things that sort of uh, evoke that part of my personality. And I think I can, I, I can end up sort of getting, getting drawn in. So we were actually just talking about, about video games and, uh, th so that is part of the appeal sometimes of, of that, um, so it can it can feel like sort of an outlet, a, a sort of a, a more healthy outlet for that. Which is not to say that I I, I wouldn't say that uh, I I don't know that it's I don't know that it's ter like terribly unhealthy, but I think there's probably a bit of an obsessive side. Yeah. So it's like a dogged determination kind of thing. Um. <clears throat> or is it just like a preoccupation or? Yeah, it's probably like a preoccupation. I think it's it's kind of um, it's a bit like uh, just something is 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 just you're you're sort of chewing on something even in the back of your mind, and it's it's always sort of running to some extent, and um, something something like that, I suppose. What are some other things you're obsessed with right now? Uh, well, you tell me. How does it look? Well, you, you say a lot of stuff about the uh, pandemic. You have a lot of opinions about that. Yeah, I do. So I, th I, I thought that would be a, a significant uh, topic of conversation, obviously. Uh, this is it could be. That, yeah. So, well, why don't we, why don't we jump right into that? Um, so. Okay. Yeah. So you wrote this, um, you wrote this essay. It's short and sweet called what is thinking and basically correct me if i'm wrong um but you said we have these uh dreams um vaccine pandemic they're like these they invoke these dream states they're conceptualizations and i guess you say it invokes a dream. It's like this whole sort of, um, it's this whole sort of view of the world and what those, what those concepts mean. And um, it's not actually, we're not actually really in touch with what those mean or something like that, the reality of those. Yeah. So we're living so in this sort of dream state around them. So yeah, and I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily reduce it to that either, but I think that there's a significant component of that. So maybe I'll maybe I'll give you an example. Um, so when I was younger, um, quite a bit younger now actually, but uh, you know, eighteen, nineteen, I was interested in uh, girls among other things, um, and um, and I, I I still haven't got over that uh, unfortunately. Me neither. But, yeah. So, but anyway. Um, and uh, I think like at the time, um, you know, you have this conceptualization of, of courtship or, or how it's going to work. And part of that is, is um, um, what the culture tells you yep. women want or what they're looking for, things like that. Uh, and, you know, part of it is just this own dream that you come up with in your head. And watching actually, movies and stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Things like that. Yeah, that's right. So it's it's very much connected to the culture, but it's also I think there's also a component that that you sort of um, yeah. Um, and so what you start to find, or at least what I found, and I think what a lot of I think what a lot of people. Now this is a good topic. Let's yeah, let's stay with this one for a little bit. Okay. Uh, yeah. So so that so that so that uh, in in reality, when you start going out on dates and when you start 
engaging in the actual territory, you find that there's dissonance between this conceptualization, this almost dream state that you're that you have that you've built, and the actual reality of what of what you're doing. And <clears throat> I think with most people, particularly at that age, the the dissonance can only be felt and addressed through pain. And I think that's really the only way that 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 dissonance is going to be made. Well, you're going to be made aware of it. Is is the pain of of failure, or the pain of failing, or the the pain of 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 thinking that you're not doing this properly? I'm inadequate. I'm, I'm you know things like that. Yeah. And 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 because otherwise, th this conceptualization is just going to run, and and there's nothing going to stop it. And so the the dissonance then is going to come from the pain of, of failure and it's going to force you to, to look at it and to say, okay, wait, this, this thing that I'm running is kind of a dream. And I have to, I have to re-examine that and I have to re-examine my assumptions about what, what, what girls are looking for and what, what they, what they respond to me, what they don't. Yeah. So the, so the perfect example there is probably like uh, girls want a nice guy or something like that. Right. Yeah. That's sort of the textbook example of like, that's pretty much a lie. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I think like you, you, you get to it's. It is. It's basically it. It's basically a lie. But um, you know, you can unpack. Okay, what do we mean by nice guy? Um, right. I know. Right. They don't want a guy that's going to be like abusing them or whatever. But yeah, um, the whole like uh, gentlemanly thing. Right. I mean, I think they want. They love a guy that's capable of being a gentleman. Yeah, for sure but not at the exclusion of like having a backbone and taking a stand and standing up for what's right and speaking their truth and so on and so forth exactly whereas like a nice guy is just trying to keep the tension off you know trying to keep things cool and relaxed and non-threatening and doesn't challenge her that's probably the key thing like people like to be challenged women like to be challenged everybody does and people that don't challenge us are kind of boring. Yeah, I uh, I agree. Yeah, that's right. Um, the, the, the the that sort of nice guy dream uh, is uh, is not a is not a particularly uh, not a particularly. I mean, you know, the, so there's a lot of things that it can help with actually. Like, I think it can ha it can actually help with relations with uh, women in in some respects, or relations with other people in some respects. But if you want to have a sort of, um, if you want to guide the relationship toward a more romantic direction, I actually think it's not a particularly functional. Yeah, idea. some polarity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you need some polarity, and and um, and I think that's what I think that's what a lot of girls, particularly at that age, are sort of looking for, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but where, what I was actually going to say about that was that uh, at that age, pain is the. Uh, is the is the dissonance is the, is the, is the distance that you you have available to you and you can you can answer that that pain that you're feeling and 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 start to look at things or you can uh, or you can or you can blame the world and say well uh, i'm right the rules wrong and i'm what i'm doing is perfectly right uh and it's not working because the girls i've gone out with are are they're whatever you know right they're, sluts. They're, lo they're looking for yeah they're looking for a biker or something you know and and i you know you see this bitterness uh in in men sort of down the road you've probably noticed it um i have nothing against like MGTOW or any any of that stuff really but like that 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 sort of uh, thing that that they say um well i was available back then but you didn't want me so why should i want like but now you want me but now you can't have me like that all that whole it's thing. this kind of revenge fantasy or something yeah, exactly. So that it's, there's that there's that like bitterness and stuff. But what what, what I was going to say about thinking though is um, it doesn't have to be that dissonance doesn't have to come from pain. I, like I think it can. I think I think I think that 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 dissonance that you need to sort of realize that the dream you're having is not is not matching reality. We can we can think we can. Uh, we can like sense that dissonance and sort of and sort of um, actualize that kind of dissonance and it's it's sort of um, um, well I know you know I know somebody that thinks thinking is a spiritual activity I don't know I, you know perhaps you know but um, 
Yeah. So when you say thinking, you don't mean what most people mean by thinking, which is they just sort of the, the, the mind does its thing and you're talking about more of an active process. Yeah, so I, I think, yeah, exactly. So um, what I mean by thinking is not necessarily, um, it's not really conceptualization per se. So um, I think that you're probably going to get that, like the mind is going to come up with some conceptualization of, of something, of of how this is going to work. Like, I like, let's say you and I having a talk, I mean, uh, how it's going to work, I'm going to need headphones, I'm going to need a thing, I sort of have a picture in my mind before we even begin. And if I didn't, um, it might be difficult to, for us even to do this. So, you know, I, I know the kind of equipment that I'm going to need, things like that. I have a, a picture in my mind. And I think it's probably fairly accurate to what we're actually going to do. Um, what, what can sometimes happen is people come up with these conceptualizations that just move out of alignment with reality. And if there's no source of dissonance in their life, they just stay on this path, which is, which is sort of out of alignment with, with reality to some extent. And so therefore, for, for me, I think thinking is, is more dissonance. It's, there's, it's a kind of dissonance. It's a kind of inner dissonance that you're actualizing, which is, which is sort of hard to describe. But, but like um, the dissonance, I think, is the closest word I can come up with. It's, it's just it's, it's like um, it's, it's, it's just it's, it's an interruption. It's, a kind, it's kind of interrupting something that's just going to march onward forever and ever so you're disrupting your own thought processes what you're saying yeah i think so i think challenging your own thought processes so you're creating dissonance between your default thought processes and other possibilities or something like that yeah i think so i mean i think something uh, something like that yeah um that's that sounds yeah so the 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 um the examples you gave are pandemic and vaccine. So let's uh let's create some dissonance. Um how do you in, in your perception, how do you people usually what's their dream state around those words? Um take your pick. So why, why don't we start with vaccine? Okay. Yeah. So I, uh, as you as you probably know, I'm not categorically anti-vaccine. Um, Correct. I think, I, I think there's a there's a place for vaccines for sure. Um, as I said in that in that uh, short thing that I wrote, um, it is kind of a it is kind of a, a a precautionary medical intervention which you know prevents the onset of disease and and prevents us from sort of spreading it to other people. And obviously that's very functional that 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 has an important function so i think like there's a there's certainly a place for for vaccination uh where i start to uh where the alarm bells start to ring for me is where this this conceptualization of a vaccine just takes over and it, it may start to dislocate itself from 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 other possibilities or from what what might be taking place so um so th- this is where i get a little bit i get you know this is where I start to, ha- I really start to object to what's taking place. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, to, to elaborate on that a little bit, because I know there's, uh, there's been a lot of, uh, the range of discussion within sort of vaccine is now really quite broad. Uh, and I'm probably not, I'm probably not uh, where I, I may come across at times. So I would say that the, I would say that the trajectory, the vaccination trajectory that we're on is, very bad. It's risky. There's a lot of risk there. Um, and, but I don't, I don't necessarily think that, that these vaccines are going to, um, like, I don't know that there's an agenda to, to do any harm to people with these vaccines. I think, I think, I think probably they will end up harming some people, but I don't think so that's, there's no microchip in them. I uh, no, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't think so. No, I, but I, but I, but the thing is, I wouldn't rule that out as part of the broader trajectory. I, w- I don't know that I would use the, I don't know that I would say microchip, but I think that, I think that once, once people can, once the society can force something into your body, um, right. and once they, and, and moreover, once they have a system to sort of exclude you from society, if you refuse, 
uh, then I think you know the sky's almost the limit in terms of what 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 could could happen. And, and I think that that dream state of vaccine as precautionary medicine is starts to move out of alignment with what with what me what may be taking place. So um, okay, so you're concerned about potential potentials where this could potentially go like what's going on in australia right now is kind of horrifying honestly um i think they're allowing people out of their houses for like an hour or something <laughs> yeah I, I saw i saw something about that i think uh i think it was one of the southern states of australia that was doing something crazy right now with pictures or something that you have to text oh right yeah i'm hearing all kinds of crazy stuff and like yeah. You're supposed to snitch on your neighbors if you know they're doing something wrong, or so if so before. So they're before definitely would, going. They're they're going down that like slippery slope of authoritarianism. Yeah, I, I it certainly looks that way. I mean, if, before I open my big mouth on on a, on our uh, talk, I would want to sort of verify that, but it certainly looks that way. Yeah, it, we we it's safe to say. Yeah. Um, they're definitely going off the rails over there. Um, I'm over here in Colorado, where I don't have to wear a mask anywhere. I mean, it's it's like there's no pandemic happening here. So, um, so I go online and I I see all of like the what I regard as hysteria around the stuff, and it's just like hard to reconcile that with my reality here. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, but I went to California for a few weeks and. Um, they were much more strict about it and there was some more much more of a palpable sense of fear in the air whereas here it's like there's no pandemic happening you know mm -hmm. there's like big big there's big crowds and stuff and so um so yeah there there are people are reacting to the dream of the pandemic in all kinds of different ways. And some people are just aren't taking it seriously at all. You know, people have dreams in both directions, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, um, so these things, there does seem to be a sort of tribalism that's emerging or that has emerged. And like, you're not, you're not anti-vaccine, but I think you sort of uh, associate with people or you feel more comfortable with people that are or something like that. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, I, I think that is accurate. Um, let me think about that for just a second here. Um, I should probably have an answer ready for that, but uh, okay. um, so, so I think um, I, so there's a lot, I think there's a lot of reasons that, that you might be that you might be anti-vaccine. Um, I and uh, I suppose I'm I'm looking I'm I, I I look more at this I'm looking more at the surface level right now than than what might be sort of motivating that. There there are a lot of and I actually think there are a lot of kind of irrational uh, anti-vaccine sentiments being expressed um, as well. Um, I, I think that this trajectory toward mandatory vaccination and passports and stuff needs to be opposed. And I, it's kind of like you, you go to war with the army that you have rather than the army that you want. So I, 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 I suppose it's, I suppose to, to, it's, it's like that to some extent, but I, I, you know, to, to like here in Canada, for example, um, I live in my college. You know, what, what do you mean? Pick your poison. Like, uh. Both, you know, both sides are toxic. So, yeah, it sounds like you're gonna you're gonna choose the side that has some skepticism, where skepticism is the sort of uh, valence, maybe. I think so. Yeah. So here, here in Montreal, for example, um, I think. Uh, Montreal was sort of the epicenter in Canada when the coronavirus hit last year, uh, and there were a lot of particularly elderly people that died. And uh, here there was a lot of 
there was a lot of fear. And I came uh, to Montreal last year in uh, at the end of July. And things were really, I would say at that point, I would use the word deranged actually, because although although it was true that there was a virus and that the virus did pose a risk, the the fear that was in the culture was you could cut it with a knife and there was enormous tension. And so uh, to go to go into the, to the grocery store, for example, so you had to wear a mask everywhere, uh, but not just that, like you could you had to sort of line up to get into a grocery store and there was two meter distances and they had sinks set up and you had to wash your hands and then dry them and there were security guards and you know, if, like, so it was, it was, uh, it was sort of like that. And it wouldn't even be that, that I would necessarily object. It's, it's the fear, you know, it's, it's, it's the sort of, it's the exaggerated sense of fear and, and all of the things that can come from that because fear tends to turn people crazy, you know, for sure. And so, and so the people who are sort of saying, look, uh, Let's just think about what we're doing here. I I, I do feel a kind of um, a kind of um, kinship with them, even yeah, if e- yeah, even if even if even if down the road it turns out that they that they think things that maybe I don't necessarily agree with. Um, I I think that like the the skepticism, for example, of the passport. So they're bringing that. So here in Montreal, actually, there's already a vaccine passport. I don't have one, as you know, uh, but uh, you need one to go to restaurants and bars and gyms and stuff. Um, and what's peculiar about this is sort of that uh, they're they're showing up in all of these other provinces where people were like, well, we're not going to put a vaccine passport system in, but you know, sure enough, BC has one now, Ontario has one now. I think <laughs> one of the maritime provinces put one in. I can't remember which one. Uh, Manitoba's putting one in, and it's this so, a legal requirement or is um, it optional? No, no, it's not optional. Uh, I don't know what the, see the legal status of all this stuff is, is, is dubious. Uh, but, but, you know, you know, so much for law, right? Like, I mean, at, in, at the, in the end, on the, you know, on the, uh, in the final analysis, it doesn't matter if it's legal or not, if everybody's doing it, that's what you have to do to some extent. No, I hear you. It's just, I think it's a lot worse when it gets imposed top down yeah so i think so so justin trudeau is uh said that he'll he will give each province a billion dollars uh to help um put our vaccine passport system in place so uh, you know a billion dollars to each province that wants to do it um the his opposition aaron o'toole who's the conservative quote unquote uh candidate here in uh, in canada has just come out and said that he is going to put in a federal vaccine passport system as well and of course, this is going to cost billions of dollars. Uh, it's not a temporary measure. I don't think it's reasonable to suppose that it's temporary given the cost. So I think they're putting this in, uh, you know, more or less permanently. And I don't see really any pushback, which is really quite, uh, I don't see enough pushback. So it's quite peculiar to me. Yeah, that's scary. Um, I was just reading there's a, there's a huge protest in Greece, I think, over mandatory vaccination. Which yeah, I didn't even, I didn't even know that uh, that was becoming a thing. Mandatory vaccinations for some groups, healthcare. Yeah. So a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the individual steps. It's it's this is what I mean about a conceptualization. I think marching onward. Um, it's 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 kind of like at, at every step in the process there's there's a rationalization there's sort of a justification and uh and before long it's like you know now we're talking about passports and so so on so it's like i i, I feel like there's an absence of dissonance uh that dissonance that should be taking place is not taking place and um and you know even people that i would expect that to come from you know like that where they're like wait a minute hold on now what like what are we doing let's think let's think this through um, the, the fear has taken over and from time to time I feel the fear of coronavirus too actually like so I can and I can empathize how people are going through this um, which is not to say that I've mastered fear or anything like that but um, I don't I don't feel like I come from that place all that often I could get corona and die from it like I know that um, 
but I just don't, I'm not coming from that place of fear really. So I sort of feel like, you know, we'll, we'll see, I guess. I, I feel yeah. like, I feel, I feel more fear about the trajectory that we're on actually. Like, so I yeah, I was going like, to say there's, there's fear on both sides, isn't there? Like, yeah, there is. Yeah. There's fear about the slippery slope and it's easy to find examples in the world of where that's actually becoming a reality, like in Australia. Um, over here, it's harder to sort of justify that kind of fear, I think. Yeah. Because every state's different here. And there's a lot of uh, pro-freedom states and you know, pro-autonomy states, such as where I am. So, um, but yeah, there's like, they have quarantine camps in Australia now. Yeah, I read something. You know, some people on the right are calling them like concentration camps, which is interesting because that's what the left were calling the the immigration, the uh, detention centers or detainment camps or whatever they're calling them now um they're calling them concentration camps kids in cages and all that and it's like there's just this hysteria where people are grossly exaggerating everything yeah i i agree um i think yeah i think i think uh yeah so this is something that you always have to be careful of um so this is all. So this 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 gets back to the other side that you that you raised when we started talking about conceptualization, and uh, it's not just the one conceptualization that can run amok. I mean, in, in principle, you can conceptualize concentration camps and all kinds of stuff like that, and uh, I don't see that I don't see that running away right now though. Um, um, like I don't like. In other words, I don't see the the conceptualization of concentration camps being made, um, getting weaponized or sort of running amok. Uh, it, it may be. I don't it's know. just I, getting started, man. Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, yeah, you're fair enough. Um, I don't know. I I have heard I have heard things about the people saying yeah concentration camps. I haven't really looked into that. Uh, not really. So I don't know. Um, I could sort of believe it with with what's taking place now, but I I don't know. So yeah, it just it seems like the right doesn't want to be like out hysteria or something, you know, like they're keeping yeah. pace with the left. Yeah, I there. Well, yeah. So this thing about not thinking, it's like, is that new? <laughs> or no, well, no, <laughs> well, no. People always have a problem with thinking. I, I think so. I, I, you know, if you read, like, so are people I, uh, dumb, Tom? Well, uh, <laughs> people, uh, people, people. So, 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 I think, I think, I think, fear is a. I think fear is a really big problem. Fear is the thing, man, and and uncertainty. Yeah. Fear of the unknown. Yeah, for sure. It's like, we don't know. Like, I don't know how the virus is going to affect me. Nor do I. Until I get it. That's right. That's life, though. It's, there it is, is it's, life. It, it's, that, it's that for almost everything imaginable. Right. So the, I guess it's the question is, do I want to take the, take the risk with the vaccine or take the risk with the virus? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I and think for a lot of people, not doing something is preferred because it's like homeostasis. Not doing something is doing something. It is, it's, yeah. um, you know, it, for, there's some there's some illusion of the mind where uh, I'm safer if I don't do something, something like that. Like with the vaccine, you know, I'm fine as I am. I don't want to introduce this new question mark into my system. So there's this perception that you're safer by not taking an intervention. 
because I haven't got maybe it's because I haven't gotten the virus yet. So and a lot of people are like, oh, I'll take my chances. Like, why are you going to trust a virus engineered in China versus a vaccine engineered in the U.S. or something like that? Right. Yeah. So I, 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 I agree. Um... I, I do I actually think that this virus probably did escape from a lab and who knows, you know, so I do think I do agree that it's it's a concern. Um, so there's yeah, there's a lot of actually there's there's that's kind of a deep question there's there's that's kind of a conversation I think I can sum it up by saying that um, there's a lot of factors and everybody sort of subjectively weighs all of the different. Um, sort of moving pieces and they, they sort of come to their own conclusion I, that's frankly what i would prefer to see um, well i don't understand all the hysteria around i mean all the fear actually it's fear around the vaccine is that justified um, i mean so my, i know I, there are i know i'm not like vaccines are perfect or whatever and these vex you know vaccines are they cause injuries we know that so but there's a, there's like it seems like the risks of the vaccines are exaggerated. Well, I would say the risk of coronavirus is probably exaggerated too. It probably has been. Yeah. Um, I've, 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 if I'm, you know, quite honestly, I have, I have, uh, I have thought about, uh, it has occurred to me to get the, to get the shot. I don't, there's, I, I just don't know. I, there's a lot of things I don't know. And I, I suppose I do default to, to inaction in a, in a, in a case like this. Um, I do trust my immune system. I mean, I think this thing evolved over 3 billion years and, uh, it's pretty good. Uh, I think I take care of myself reasonably well. Um, yeah, I hear that a lot about people trusting their immune systems, but this is also how many, there's something like 650, how many deaths in the U S yeah, I think you're, I think. 600 and something thousand, yeah. 650,000. I mean, that's that's a big number. <laughs> you know, we probably will get to a million at some point. So the big number, I, I'm not sure if it's a reliable number. Fair enough. Um, I, I looked up- Because it's up basically up. including all the people who died with COVID. So there's that. Um, I, I looked up- uh, Rather than from, per se. Yeah, so I, it seems that, that it has quite a um, comorbidity is, is a real factor. Um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to say. Um, I, you know, I, there's, a lot of, there's, a lot, there's a lot of moving pieces. It's, it's really hard to say something. It's, it's hard to come down definitively on something, although I, I come down pretty definitively against mandatory vaccination. And I think that that's where we're headed. So I, I, this is, this is the bulk of the problem that I have really. I, I, you know, I, there's also an element of stubbornness to me, which is like, okay, if you're going to make it mandatory, then I'm not going to take it. I don't care if I die. I hear you. So. Yeah. I agree with you on that. And I think a lot of people do. Most people are opposed to mandatory vaccination. Um, especially now that we have to take like what four shots or something. Yeah. So the other thing that gets me is that is that I think that these passports are going to be used to lever people toward getting another booster, and and and, and so I just see coercion there, and I I don't like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I just read that Israel approved a fourth shot. I saw that. Yeah. And they seem to be the most like conservative with their interventions or conservative with the virus or whatever, you know, they seem to be like on top, you know, all about the vaccine. So, um, I think, you know, Marshall, what it really comes down to is, is a, a lack of trust. In, in the systems that we have. Um, I, I, I definitely feel a, a very strong distrust of them now. Um, that's probably the source of a lot of disagreement I think that people have. I think probably most people would dis would agree that vaccines shouldn't be mandatory. Um, but 
if they're not mandatory, then so it's like, well, why don't you, why don't you take it? Why don't you want it? Um, and I think a lot of people, and I would probably include myself in this category. Um, I trust my immune system more than I trust what's happening out there at this point. So I think that's a factor. I, it's a subjective factor. Um, I don't know if it's correct. It's sort of my instinct about it. Um, like I said, that could, that could prove to be wrong and even disastrously wrong. Um, yeah. I mean, I trust my immune system, but you know, it's kind of like a gazelle saying, you know, I trust my running speed. Right. Until one day it, there's it a lion you. that's faster. Yeah. You know, it's the same thing, isn't it? Um, let me think about that. I mean, yeah, your immune system works. 99.9 percent .9 of the time more than that it's just that well this virus has killed like what one point in the u.s 1.6 percent of people of the cases supposedly supposedly i think the death toll in canada is thirty thousand something in that neighborhood let me just check on that um Have a running total. Let me see if I can just find it. Uh, Twenty-six thousand deaths, uh, one point five million cases. Uh, that's confirmed cases, not estimated cases. When you look at estimated cases, uh, the the mortality rate does drop. Um, so if you if you if you if you take the death the, the number of deaths as a fun, like and divide by um, confirmed cases, you'll see a death toll that starts to look. Well, there are a lot of people that have died though. I, like it's complicated, you know. I'm not I'm not I'm not going to come on here and say like it's not complicated. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. And and actually the death thing, I'm not even concerned about dying. I'm just more concerned about long covid. Yeah. Brain damage or neurological damage or So I wouldn't want that either. <laughs> right. That's the real risk. And so oh, I basically, I may, you know, I just made, I basically made a, uh, I took a calculated risk. I just thought, well, I'm going to get, I'm gambling either way. Yeah, I suppose that's true. You got, I don't you know got, that uh, most people uh, who are anti-vaccine, they don't see it that way. They don't see that they're gambling. Think they so? think they're safe. And the risk is with the vaccine or something like that. It's like there's a confidence. There's this like, there's this like, in my opinion, unjustified confidence that they're safe from it. Hmm. You know, and there's all these stories now, the media plays them up about this guy like refused a vaccine and on his death, you know, he's dead now. And on his deathbed, he recanted and yeah, yeah, I know. I see something. So I, I, you know what I think about the mainstream media. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Um, not, but the thing is that that can happen, and that I'm sure that I'm sure what they're reporting is true. That that did happen. Um, yeah, I mean, it's right now the the Florida is Florida is probably one of the anti-vaccine states and they're doing, they're getting something like 20,000 new cases a day, 46,000 deaths. So I don't know, man, I'm not, again, I'm not really concerned about the deaths, but like there's been 3.3 million cases in Florida. And what is that going to do to people's brains, you know? Yeah. There's an, I mean, econo there's an economic cost to... Oh, to everything. To everything. 
It's a lockdown. There's no, there's, there's Are no we doing like lockdowns? Is anyone doing lockdowns anymore other than Australia? Uh, Canada isn't at the moment. I think that the, the vaccine passport is, you know, in theory, it's to prevent us from having to lock down again. Okay. So, yeah, uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the story anyway. Um, it's, look, it's complicated. Here, here's the thing, Marshall. Uh, I, I, think, I think I'm probably less of an anti-vaxxer than you imagine. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't think that people are seeing both ways. And so this is kind of the problem I have it, is that is that in order for us to like in order for us to take like kind of a balanced approach to this, I, I think people need to see they need to see uh, both sides and they need to see both sides in their own native terms. And and in, in so doing, we can recommend we can make a more we can take a more balanced approach to, to making recommendations. And I have I really have no problem with people getting vaccinated. I, I think. I don't know. Of course, you know, I, people say, oh, it's going to kill people. No, I don't know. Um, the vaccine is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, think, I think there's you, people... You must be exposed to a lot of that, a lot of those kind of hysterical claims. Well, I, I, but you're I, not I, as concerned about them. No, you know, you don't really speak out about those. Right? I, I, don't, I don't see that as a realistic... I don't see that as... A, so I... I so there's, I have seen some hysterical claims about their vaccines are going to give you HIV and things like that. I, I don't see that as a risk. I don't see what, that as what like, would you say to someone who, who said that um, the vaccinated are shedding spike proteins and making other people sick? Um, so based on my understanding of the way it's me- mechanistically working, I would say that's unlikely. Uh, but if people say that they're having reactions around people that have been vaccinated, I, you know, what can I say? Um, maybe they, maybe they're not. I don't know. They say that they are. I don't know what's in the vaccine, Marshall. If it's just an, if it's, a, if you know, if it's, if it's an, if it's a piece of mRNA that's on a, that's on a lipid nanoparticle, then in principle, it'll just get injected. It'll get absorbed through the cell membrane. It'll be translated into protein, and then the mRNA will be degraded by a nucleus or whatever. And then in principle, that protein is going to elicit is going to is going to, you know, form the basis for an immune response so that you'll be you'll you'll have some immunity against that part of the virus, the spike protein. Now, I happen to think that that immunity is a lot is piss poor compared to natural immunity, which will be which will be more than just a small piece of a spike. Protein. Right. So the spike protein is just a single vector or something, right? Yeah. So and then you'll have it's like, inadequate. Compared to um, natural immunity, yeah, I would, I would, I would think, I would, I would think so. Um, I don't know. Um, I, yeah. So I, I, I think. Look, there, I think there's, I think there's a lot of people who are 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 quite like in, intuitive, let's say, and I think that they see that there's there, there's a trajectory here that's a risk. Okay. And but, but I don't I don't know that they're accurately pinpointing the risk. They know there's a risk. And then they, they, it's like, it's a bit like the carpet is pulled out from under your feet and you, you just land on the first thing available and you say, here's the risk. And I'm not sure. I hear you. I, yeah. So I, you know, I do agree that there's a risk, that, that, that there's a risk in the trajectory. I don't like the trajectory. I think, I think the trajectory is, is a big risk. Um, as, as for where the risk falls uh, closer to the ground, it's very hard to say, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. In principle, an MRA vex, mRNA, vaccine, if it works according to the mechanism, uh, maybe it shouldn't be a problem, but you know, maybe it does, not, not many things actually work according to the proposed mechanism. So there's a lot of slips, twixt cup and lip, as they say. So do you, st- do you actually like get into the science of this stuff? Of the vaccines? Yeah. A little bit. I've, I've watched, uh, I've watched some of the lectures on how, how it's supposed to work, the mechanism of, of, of function. Immunology is very, very complicated. And uh, I think so I'm not an immunologist. I know a little bit, but I, I don't know that much. And I know, I know enough that it's like, that I can see how complicated it is. Um, the one thing about, about a field being very complicated is it's usually not something you can, you can just be like, well, we inject it, the thing goes there, it does this and it. Okay, there's a, lot of, there's, there's a lot of complexity there. And there, you know, so uh, it may not be that simple. And in fact, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things, even in the proposed mechanism where I can see something may go, another way, you know, 
solved. Um, I'm skeptical. Let's say I'm skeptical about about the uh, how the vaccines work. Well, how how they're how they're designed to work. I'm not skeptical about that. I I I'm skeptical about whether whether uh, whether it's, there's going to be off target activity or whether it's going to do something else or whether there's going to be some some side reaction or something like that. Um, you know, I as as you know, at my work, what I do, like I can mix four chemicals together, and 200 years of 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 careful study of organic chemistry, and we know actually with really well how, how this stuff works. I mean, at least we think we do. And you can mix four chemicals together and you can still get a completely unexpected product that you didn't think was going to happen. And you can still get small products that form and you really have no idea what it is. So that, and that's just, you know, you mix four chemicals together. If you put some, some complicated construct in, in the human body, which is, which is complicated almost beyond fathoming, uh, and you think that it's just going to go according to this neat diagram that you've written. I, you know, I don't know. Right. Right. So you, you work on cancer drugs. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Have you cured cancer yet? No, I'm afraid not. It seems to be a, a persistent problem. What do you, I mean, what do you, what do we pay you for, man? Yeah. You're not getting much of a return on the, uh, on the <laughs> investment. Actually the, the, the um there there are there are some improvements like things are getting a lot better like some really they're they're getting better and um it seems like some of the immunotherapies that are that are being developed are really really promising but uh um you know it's stuck maybe we're not, maybe we're not quite there yet i i wouldn't you know just to add one thing about what we were what we were discussing um i don't like i don't i don't look down on or badmouth anybody who's against vaccines or anything like that. I'm, I'm a little critical about, about people who say that, you know, everyone's going to die. I don't know. I, you know, they, 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 they think they, they, they've seen something that makes them think that I, I just, you know, I, I'm not so sure, but I, but I do see a risk in the trajectory. Yeah. I hear you there. Um, so I don't know. Sometimes it just seems like anti-vax is just the shadow, you know, the shadow of or the mirror image of pro-vax. It's like people that just sort of mindlessly, you know, instead of receiving top-down like authority, they're more just receiving it from the the herd and you know, f- fake news spreads like 10 times faster than real news or something. And so it's it's actually as someone that's concerned about thinking i would think you would be sensitive to that or have an allergy to the quality of thinking in these uh anti-vaccine circles um because it's mind-numbing and i'm you know i don't i do i do some research into um you know, I, de- I decided on the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The DNA one, I think. It's a... Um, Viral vector or something, is that what it is? Yeah, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> um, but I sort of decided like that one was safer because it had more research behind it or something like that. I mean, I didn't put a lot of thought into this. That was a one-dose one, right? Yeah. And that was part of the appeal also. One and done. And I didn't have any side effects. Uh, you know, some soreness. And that's it. No biggie. So, um, so you know, and I'm not a... Uh, uh, I, do, I do see people, people have, like, maybe way too much trust in the vaccines. On the pro-vax side almost like oblivious to the risks, don't care, whatever. Okay. So, um, so I know there are risks. I just, again, my, my issue has to do with like the quality of information and, um, 
like one of the like ivermectin have you done any research into that not really um it's just become this political thing so i know it yeah yes um i see that yeah um Again, I don't know. I, I somebody got a Nobel Prize for it. The, the structure looks. People say it's simple. The structure looks really complicated. So I don't know. They say it's easy to make. Doesn't look that way to me. But anyway, maybe they isolate it from something. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I can see that that it's it's a it's just another um, proxy in the in the culture war. It's just another sort right. of theater right. of war in the. Yeah, and you know, I've actually been on both sides of that. And I would, uh, if, if I felt some really promising research came out that supported it, I'd probably go pick some up. I mean, I've been on the verge. I'm kind of like you in vaccines. I've been kind of like on the verge of buying some and then I just don't, <laughs> whatever. But um, now there's like fraudulent research, you know, fraudulent research on it. It's like, why are you faking research? Why do you have to do that? if it really does what it says, you know? And we're in this like postmodern reality where like what I want to believe is more important than what's true. Mm. And I know you have a, you have your own take on what postmodernism is. And there's a lot of confusion around that. So maybe we should talk about that because uh, a lot of people think we're living in the postmodern condition. Where there is no objective truth. And so we sort of default to, and everything is power. Yeah, that's right. Is that an acceptable description of postmodern, of the postmodern condition? I mean, I know your take is more comprehensive because postmodernism is this really big, broad field. Um, and so the power stuff, I guess, is more like post-structuralism. Yeah, so I think, I think the, the, the power stuff sort of comes as a result of something maybe, which is that uh, um, um, the, the sort of extreme relativism. And so as a result, uh, there is no ultimate, you know, sort of structure to anything. It's just, it's just what what people perceive to be the case, and therefore, what rises to prominence in a society at any, at any given time is more a function of power than it is of of uh, reason, for example, or innate biological proclivities or anything like or that. Merit or so on and so forth. Exactly. So, I, and you know, I, I it probably goes without saying that I I don't think that's sound. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, um, but I, this I preoccupation with power though, and the power structures, I mean, we don't trust the vaccine because of power. Well, we don't trust the pandemic. We don't even trust the virus. I mean, there were people in our community who were saying that germ theory is a conspiracy, you know? Mm. So, so I, 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 and that's all to... because everything is power now. I kind of feel like we've all been postmodernized without even realizing it. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I think I, well, yeah, I, I think, well, like, you know, Wil Wilbur, for example, who, who is, who is my sort of doorway into, into, you know, integral and all that, all that stuff. Um, you know, he, he, I think highlighted the sort of dimensions of the postmodern wave that we're in really well, I think better than anyone. Um, and I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that's just part of the wave that we're going through. Um, I, I really kind of frame it in terms of, in terms of meaning though. Um, and this sort of gets, gets to the pandemic as well, where, um, what, what do things mean? So you said something, uh, you, you mentioned, for example, uh, the risk of, of the vaccine versus the risk of, so the, I think for, for, for me and for other people who are sort of on the, I don't want to say anti-vax, but let's say whatever. Vaccine skeptical. Yeah. Um, it's, not that, it's not that we're seeing risk in vaccine. I think the risk that people are perceiving is 
a, the risk in the loss of freedom and the risk in, in the trajectory toward manda mandating things and all of the things that are going to come from that. So I think the meaning that people on that side are perceiving is uh, what, what all this means is loss of freedom. And, 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 and so when people say, oh, the vaccines are, they're not risky, they don't, they, a lot of people actually don't really care. You're not, because it's, that's not the risk that they're worried about actually. Um, and I, and I actually, I know a lot of people that are, that are kind of against what's happening and, but they still got the vaccine because they figure, well, look, this is probably a bio weapon. I'm going to get my vaccine, but I don't like where this is going either. Sure. And those are probably the most sensible people actually. Yeah, I mean, I would put myself in that camp. And it's interesting that you said that people don't want to get the vaccine because it represents not having freedom. I mean, that's why I got the vaccine. So I'm like, so I just, it's like, I know it's a risk. I'm going to roll the dice. I'm a risk taker uh, because I want freedom. I want freedom from caring about it. You know, I don't want to think about it anymore. Yeah, so I would say for, for me. And freedom, I know that the vaccine can provide like a false sense of security. But it does seem like now it does provide some protection, you know, including from long COVID. Yeah, maybe it's. So that's the thing. It, to me, it represents freedom. When I sort of disconnect it from that, because we have, because those aren't the only dreams, right? Those aren't the only conceptualizations. We also have government and the state or the deep state or, you know. Um, mainstream media. I mean, in reality, these things are incredibly complex. Government, 99.999% of government is just boring and mundane stuff, you know? Um, so, so people, so we're all in these dreams of the establishment, government, the state, and all that, and what those things represent. So we're all sort of trapped in the dream Mm. Well, that's that's also part of uh, that sort of postmodern wave, I think, where where uh, the, the, what things mean. Just there's so much divergence, and people, um, everybody's having a different dream. I suppose you could say in terms of like what do things mean, and 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 therefore what are the risks. So if this means something, if this means this, then here are the then here are the risks, and if this means this, well then here are the risks. And so you have a lot of people that are really responding to different risks. And I think, and I think the next wave is to sort of is to sort of understand all of that and find uh, a way to sort of honor that in a way that, or move forward in a way that sort of uh, acknowledges all of that. If somebody, if somebody think, if somebody sees a real risk, for example, to their health for getting a vaccine, then I I respect that uh, because it's not just. Because there's 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 questions. I think there are questions related to personal health uh, that are that extend beyond what science can model. Uh, for, for example, perhaps people know that they have allergic reactions reactions to certain things, or perhaps they. Um, so I think so. I think there's that as well. But um, yeah, basically, I don't know. I it's it's kind of a complicated mess. It's really kind of an, a, a knot to untie now because, and it's just because of that. So given your awareness of the complexity, everybody's a moron, nobody's, nobody can think, why even bother with this whole thing? Like, why not just... Just make a whiskey and lemonade and sit out on the porch. Why not just unplug, man? Like, that's kind of something a lot of people are waking up to. It's like... We're plugged into this giant, you know, field of the collective field, the collective field of consciousness. And it's just endless insanity, <laughs> no matter where you look, anywhere in the world, you know, any subject that's part of the collective field is just like mired in insanity. <laughs> so why it's kind of masochistic that we sort of like wake up and then plug into this thing and then like become more mentally ill from it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been dealing with the whole, um, the woke stuff 
And lately I am just, I'm unplugging from it, man. It's like, I'm going to lend my discrimination about it when I'm called to, but I'm going to stop the whole, you know, constantly ruminating about it and constantly learning about it. And the latest news article about some stupid woke person in like California school is, you know, trying to teach their kids about communism or something, you know, it's like, there's, it's like this endless outrage machine that we're all kind of plugged into. So why do we do that? And why don't we stop? <laughs> so why don't yeah. we stop until like when one day I think, I don't know, it's, it's got to kind of run its course or something, right? Or no. Hmm. That's a complicated question. I don't really have yeah. the answer. Uh, I, I think I so I think there's I think there is definitely um, yeah so I think I think the answer I would give you is uh, a regard for truth you there is there is there is some level of objective reality out, outside my window there um, and and if people are not you know you have to be careful saying truth as though you have like a, a monopoly on I get it I get it but on the other hand you know there 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 are there are times when people are are really out of out of phase with reality sometimes um and I think you know maybe there's a couple of things there's there's that sort of the world is a mess try to fix it and then there's the uh you know existence is kind of a, a gift enjoy it and don't 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 ruin your life over all this craziness. Try to enjoy your life. Um, and of course, the, the, the more that you perceive insanity, the, the harder it is to do this. So the challenge sort of rises uh, um, with, with, with each other to some extent maybe. But um, yeah, I, I think, uh, I think, I think, I, I really think for me, I, I feel sort of, I think like if you see somebody doing something that's going to hurt themselves and they don't know, maybe like you, you, you feel called to say something, even if you don't know how to do it, like, like for, for me, I'm not really sure how to, how to do it. Um, but the, the, that calling is still there. Um, no, I hear you. Cause I obviously, you know, it's like I answered the call. Yeah. Um, it's like I was in a position where I had a particular perspective and insight. And I had to do something, you know, or so I thought, and I'm doing something, you know. Um, but at some point, I just recognized how draining it was to me. It's like draining my energy. It's draining my enjoyment of life. Um, and from that place, I end up being more reactive, more cynical, you know, more in shadow, so to speak, victim, victim mentality. It's really easy to say, oh, look, there's a problem out there and, you know, it's going to hurt us and it's going to, you know, it's real easy to slip into uh, to victim mentality. And I recently read about two different orientations to life. One, which most of us have is the problem orientation. It's like, we look at the problem and then we say, okay, I've, you know, I'm, I now have to fix that problem versus something like the creative orientation. Rather than like identifying problems, it's like, well, what can we create from here? You know, we've got this, uh, it's like fighting cancer. It's a good example. It's trying to solve a problem. But how do we create health? <laughs> you know, nobody's really, we don't really understand what causes cancer. Um, but it's probably some kind of something that we're not doing to create health. So, so I kind of yeah. see that problem orientation itself. So this is where... So I, by the way, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not against the germ theory. 
Um, no, I, think, I, 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 I looked. I looked into. I looked into this though, and uh, I think the like the opposite is, or what the opposite is taken to be is terrain theory. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's both, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's sort of a both. So it's kind of like it, it doesn't. Uh, the terrain theory does not seem to deny a virus or a bacteria as a germ. It 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 says that it's it, it says that it's sort of a reductionistic way of looking at it or whatever to blame um, the germ yeah 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 which, which is which which is what you sort of um what came to my mind listen to you talk about cancer and, and health um because actually I, I i happen to think uh it is that way by and large with cancer now if 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 uh if a, if a really important gene gets mutated you only have one copy like you know, whatever what is it p57 or something like that that stops uh, you know, cell division, you okay, you may, you know, no amount of apples, so to speak, you know, but like, um, but for the most part, I think a lot of, I think a lot of, uh, there's probably a lot of cancer that, that appears and progresses as a result of the terrain, so to speak. Um, that's my intuition on it. Uh, that makes sense. Say, yeah. It's hard to say. Um, I can't actually, argue with that because they, because there's all, like smoking. What does smoking do? Well, it fucks up the terrain, doesn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of pre net like there's benzene, for example. There's uh, ethylene oxide. Um, th there are things that sort of alkylate the bases in DNA, and so those are obviously uh, those are risk factors for cancer, no doubt about it. Because they what fuck up DNA? <laughs> is that the, yeah, is that so the technical term for it. Yeah. So that, yeah, basically. So if you if you have like a like um, a chemical, so imagine you know you have DNA, and uh, there's nitrogen atoms. I like I'm drawing with my finger. That's a that's a bad habit. Uh, and you have like something Sounds good. Called, if you if you alkylate it, then it's going to interrupt. It might interrupt transcription. It might interrupt the transcription of a gene that's involved in in maintaining homeostasis of the cell or preventing um, proliferation things like that. Uh, it may it may disrupt all kinds of stuff. So you know it's 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 a risk factor for sure. I see. So and how's the gene repair science going? Uh, so that the actually there are there are drugs. Uh, that's not really my. I haven't looked into that too much. Um, there are there are. Uh, I know people that are working on a project that's related to that. Actually, believe it or not. Uh, but the body has has mechanisms to actually do DNA excision repair and things like that. So the the, the body's actually pretty good at it too. I see. Not perfect. Though. Interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah, I remember there was one of these transhumanist guys that inve injected himself with CRISPR. It seems he like died. Yeah, he crazy. died. <laughs> so maybe that's gene. Maybe that's not there yet. No, I don't think so. Um, so this is why this, this is also one of the reasons I'm a, I'm a little skeptical about uh, people making kind of exaggerated claims about I, the thing is, though, I, I don't I don't know. So I and there are people that I respect who think that some of this stuff with vaccines. And so, um, you know, I, I hear you. Everything's complicated. And we, yeah. we can't draw conclusions about anything. And um, yeah, we all oh, yeah, just yeah. sort of default to a kind of a gut level. Do I trust the man or not kind of thing? I don't, I don't, I don't have a problem with drawing conclusions actually, but, um, I think, I think it's, uh, it's you gotta be, you gotta be careful when you rule something out. I think sometimes well, there's just so much more we don't know than we do know. That's it. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of things that people are saying they're really very unlikely and I sufficiently so that I, I don't, I don't know that it's worth spending too much time, you know, worrying about, um, I think there are things, even if, it, even, let's say, it, let's say, even if it, if it were true, it wouldn't actually change the overall, um, sense I have of the, of the risk of the trajectory. It would, it would only, it would only 
like uh, shift the risk to closer to the present moment to some extent. So I suppose that's how I. So okay, but again, like, doesn't it doesn't it wear on you? Like, aren't you sick of this shit? Oh yeah, no, yeah, for sure. And it's it's a kind of a war, um, but it's not. You know, in a in war, real war, it's like you're fighting a little bit, and then the war, you know, the fighting stops for a while. In this case, we're like always plugged into the matrix, so it's just like war every day, every day, and it's it's psychologically taxing. Well, it's taxing. Actually, it's it's taxing if you're. So to use the, the, the metaphor of the matrix, it's taxing in and taxing out for different reasons. Taxing it to me, not be part of it. Yeah, that's tough. I don't think so. I think there's these plenty of these like Thoreau guys who are just, you know, living in their cabins in the woods and they're chilling. You know, they just. That's the thing to do, actually. Just get away from all this. This is so unnatural that we're plugged into this like global news thing. Yeah. It's like global, like 24 seven disasters and outrage. Yeah. This is so unnatural. It is. I agree. Uh, yeah, for sure, man. I, I agree with you completely on that. Um, Cause it becomes a secondary reality almost like it, it's sort of like, it really kind of becomes, starts to become a dream. It is a giant dream, man. Yeah. And all of these echo chambers on the internet, you know, like like the um, the whole woke systemic racism thing. You know, they organized in these insular echo chambers on the internet for mm-hmm. like, what, 20 years or something. And they came out with all these theories and they started acting on them and like, not once did anybody question or scrutinize these theories because if you did, you got tossed out. And so, so, and that's just one echo chamber. And then yeah. you got these other like red pill guys and they've been in their own little insular echo chambers. And so now we're just dealing with like this war over whose dream is right or whose dream will dominate. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. So you have you have a lot of sort of spheres of this is the factionalization, uh, which which has come from from the 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 uh, the, alter, the the alternative interpretation of of things. I think, and and uh, people get into these silos for sure. But I think I think generally they all have something uh, that they're that they're that they're pointing to, which is true. And sometimes they're pointing to things that are that are not true, but yeah, um, they all have a seed of truth, but they're totalizing. Yeah, that's right, exactly. And yeah. that's the thing. That's where I take a stand against really anything, uh, be it conspiracies or whatever, is the totalizing. You know, cons- conspiracy conspiracy totalism is where anything that happens is like folded into yeah yes I, that is a thing yeah the grand conspiracy theory of everything so in other words down to not, everything from like germs you know so it's which, not nothing is nothing is falsifiable at that point nothing is falsifiable and so and and when you try to falsify you get kicked out of the echo chamber so you know we have a we have mutual friends who insulate themselves, anybody who questions, even sympathetic people who question the um, the totalism or try to add nuance or try to respect the complexity of things, they're tossed out. Yeah, I-, I You know, this I, blocking I, mechanism is just, you know, we, it's, that's also unnatural. I agree. That's one thing I try to avoid blocking people. Although I have, I, I, I must confess to losing my temper at times with people for sure. Um, because you know, it's good to take a time out. I think. Yeah. 
when you get into you know what we would call object relations and it's like a kind of obsessive loop with that person it's like okay take a time out yeah but but the blocking um i think it was alex pfeiffer that said you know we were, we didn't evolve to deal with man vanishes you know like a man in our community yeah, no, yeah. just vanishes into thin air so we don't have to deal with them anymore it's true it's true i think we should you know i think we should have to like if we're going to be in community like we should learn to deal with the people that trigger us but we have but on the internet you know we have these private groups and we have these um in the blocking mechanism and you can basically create your own reality that's free of anybody that's going to challenge you while everybody that's there is the one they, they provide you with some narcissistic mirroring on some level on some level they say hey you're right and you're smart and you're a good person you know yeah yeah for sure there's a bit of a high that you get from that yeah, yeah, you get you get to feel good about yourself every day of the year. You get to post the most insane shit, and then you get like seventy likes. Mm. And that's some people. That's all they live for. That's all they live for are the likes. It's sad, man. Whereas I've been practicing for the longest time. I I, I just say the shit that like nobody is gonna like. Um. Not because it's not true, but because like they don't necessarily want to align themselves publicly with something I've said. Yeah, so I so I, I know how that feels too. Uh, uh, for sure. I so I've had you know I've had I've I've had a lot of people and friend me and so on criticizing some of the woke stuff and and more recently you know taking what what a lot of people can consider to be sort of a conspiratorial framing of of things. I would I would just say that like one of the things the word conspiracy does is it tends to suggest that this type of thing is is um, is uncommon, I or or that it's I I think that like I think that I think that there are I think that um, I think that it's politics to some extent. Um, so conspiracy is another dream. Yeah, for sure. I. This is why I like it. It, it, it's like there, there always, you always have, you always have to be continuously actualizing some kind of dissonance. Otherwise you get, you just, it's, it's crazy what can happen. So why do people, I mean, why do people then perceive you as conspiratorial in your thinking or. So I, so what perceiving so, conspiratorial activity yeah. or something. So I would I would I would answer that by saying that one of the ways of uh, of um, of making one of the ways of prioritizing is in terms of urgency, and so one one of the things that I that I that I mentioned before is that like I don't like I feel like a lot of people are not getting like the both ways of seeing or multiple ways of seeing something, and there's a certain element of like okay people are not seeing this they're really not seeing this and it's like whether it's whether it whether it's true per se like whether it's definitely this is for sure i don't know but what i do know is to, it is sufficiently plausible that it's enormously urgent and so therefore um this thing has to like people have to start considering this and and it's it, it gets quite it gets quite frustrating at times when people uh find that it uh you know, it, that can't be it just can't be happening um and sometimes in spite of in spite of the evidence so i think in canada we're certainly moving toward mandatory vaccination um so i think you know that that's kind of an urgent thing to, to take stock of i think yeah i mean even if it never happens uh somebody needs to be concerned about it potentially happening right so and you know um and what are the and what are the ramifications of that and like what are and the ramifications of it actually are, 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 I think, even more important because, like, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you've decided what the meaning of vaccination is, and this gets back to what we really started the, the conversation with, you know, the, the dream of vaccination, if that's what it means, and if that's all it means, then maybe the ramifications of mandatory vaccination aren't that severe or aren't that important to consider. It's kind of a drag, you know, we, I'd rather not have it forced, but af after all, it's. I hear you. Um, 
Yeah. Um, so. So it, yeah, it gives them the power to do all kinds of mandatory, compulsive things, compulsory. Right. So there's a certain element of uh, of, of urgency there. If even if even it's not if even some of the details aren't fully fleshed out or clear, and I think that's where a lot of people um, get frustrated. Where I don't have the whole story to tell you, but I can see some things which add up to a, a high likelihood of something that we should be concerned about. And, and I think what a lot of people expect is if, and maybe reasonably, but they expect that if you're going to make a claim, um, you need to have, you need to have like some a sufficient amount of evidence, which is clear in its ability to um, make evident what what's being claimed. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And sometimes that's difficult. So, yeah. So, so, um, so would you say you're more a libertarian or? I don't know. I, you know, I, I suppose for, for lack of a better word. Or lean, um, do, do you lean right? Yeah, I certainly do now. I didn't used to, you know, um, uh, I, I used to be, uh, I used to be kind of a lefty left, left leaning guy. Um, I don't think I was ever one of these crazy left lefty people. So that's probably why I like I started spotting it a while ago, like being like Jesus. Center like, left, maybe. Yeah, something like that, you know. Like, um and you know, I, I actually I, I started I started reading Mises around 2013 or so, Mises and some of these people, because I was really sort of curious. Actually, Ron Paul, it was Ron Paul, um, uh, the, the the movement that happened around Ron Paul in 2012, and people were really uh, in, curious about Ron Paul, very interested in Ron Paul. And I remember feeling like, you know, wow, who's this guy? And he had some interesting things to say. I didn't really feel like I understood it. And so I looked up Ron Paul, and he was talking about Austrian economics, which I had no idea what they were. And so I figured, okay, let's let's read some of this stuff. And uh, I actually I found it really quite persuasive, actually. And so there, it it really forced me to sort of Put to bed a lot of things that I thought might be possible, um, which is not to say it's not to say that you don't you no longer want um, you know people to have sufficient material resources to, to live and to get by and stuff. It's just that you it it really it really puts a pretty steep curve on how you can go about doing that. Right. So, that was that was sort of the experience I had about it. Right, left. I don't know. I guess I guess I'm on the right. You'd have I would you would I would have to say yeah, that. Yeah, you probably come down on like autonomy and yeah. But not but but you know it's not. This is I think another thing that that like what does it mean to be in favor of autonomy? Does it does it mean that you are against the the community, for example? Well, not necessarily, but it may be that like it may be kind of a, a recommendation to err on the side of autonomy because the community, yeah, yeah. community might be going, <laughs> you know, right. So. Mob rule and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I see. And you, and so tell, I mean, actually I'd, I'd be curious about your, uh, how you, how you see yourself on, in that respect. I would say I am, I strongly lean towards autonomy. I mean, it depends, right? Um, depends on what we're talking about. Um, it's like something like social security. I'm not going to lean right on that unless it, you know, unless it means like social security, social security, you know, is our retirement program. Um, Unless it, leaning right means like shoring it up and making it more sustainable. But I'm probably going to take a pretty left position on that. I mean, isn't that kind of what we do at Integral is look at, isn't that what we're supposed to do? <laughs> kind of like treat every issue. Um, 
you know, treat every issue as its own issue and kind of like look for solutions on all sides and so on and so forth, or create a more integral solution or something like that. So Corey uh, talks about, I think he calls it um, Maslowian capitalism or Maslowian socialism or something like that. It's like socialism for the people on the bottom of the, you know, the pyramid of actualization or the hierarchy of needs. So the people, so socialism for the people on the bottom and then kind of like moving people up where it gets more free and capitalism and so on and so forth. So which, which is a kind of a stage model. It says different things are, diff are appropriate at different stages. But I tend to, and this may be a second tier thing or whatever, integral thing as well. I tend to favor more freedom. Yeah, I think that's a wise place to, to err. But I can't really call myself a libertarian. Well, when people ask, that's usually what I what I say. Um, I, I guess that's the best. Uh, um, that's still the, the closest to the to the to the reality. Libertarians are sort of falling out of. I don't know that they were ever in fashion, but. <laughs> yeah, you're right. People are. People. So, yeah, the the that uh, I think the the. the um, Where are they the, go? They're, what are they becoming like fascist or something? <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't really. I, I don't. You see, the thing, like fascism is is coming back in style. Uh, well, on and bo on both sides, perhaps. I think I the the problem is the well, authoritarian authoritarianism on both sides. Yeah. yeah well. Yeah. 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 Um, I think I think the people I think the people like on the on the right, so to speak, um, would like um, would like would like pushback. Would like their side to push back in a way that's like um, proportional, and I don't think they I don't think they're seeing that, and so they're sort of saying like they're sort of saying people that are at this point advocating for a libertarian, more hands off, less faire approach, while our institutions are being culturally subverted. By yeah, the it's that is 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 an inappropriate recommendation. I don't know. Uh, no, I agree. I can I can understand their I can understand their position though. Like I. I remember reading something Charles Krauthammer said, and I, um, you know, he was he was like a conservative uh, pundit who passed away a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But he basically said libertarianism is a statement on the Leviathan state. Yeah, that's, it's not that's... an actual. It's not an actual governing philosophy. Yeah, I that I I, I really like that a lot. I I like that a lot. So. Um, Yes, I agree completely with that. Actually, it's uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a criticism of of, of statism. It's a it's a critique against uh, various elements of 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 the state or statism. Um, yeah, which so are, it's handy. Yeah, it's valuable. Uh, it's useful. It's a check. So it's like good that people take that position, but it's interesting now that it's sort of losing traction on the right well, yeah in general or on the right it's losing popularity I, I, yeah. which to me suggests that more people are they're 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 leaning more towards statist or authoritarian solutions mm. Yeah. Well, I, I think we're, yeah, I, so probably you have to, I think I would, I would say we're probably stuck with, with, with the reality of the state. Um, uh, I, I don't, I don't see that it's really feasible or practical to, to have a society without that, that, that structure in place. But I think, I think we really have to, one of the things we have to do is we have to understand that what it is, is violence as Per that libertarian critique and other things that, that its function actually is among other things uh violence you you need some level of violence to keep a civil society in well it's an attempt to control violence is it not oh yeah no no for sure I, sort of I, like I, let's take let's take let's 
let's take objective ownership of violence, or at least have someone accountable. So, you know, somebody take control of violence that's at least accountable to other people, to the to the population. Yes, yes. Uh, no, I agree. I, uh, you're, 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 you're quite right about that. But uh, I, I'm just pointing out that there's that there's violence there in the equation. And, uh, and the the expansion. So I, in other words, the point was, I think we have to be very strategic about how we set that that apparatus up and how we put limits in place. And, you know, the various people now that are proposing the expansion of government for the purposes of controlling what people say and what gender pronouns they're allowed to, it's, it's, it's ridiculous because who's doing because, that? You mean like, uh, who's no, I'm, propo- just, I'm just kidding. I know who's doing that. Yeah. But so what actually, and what it really amounts to is, you know, it's, it is proposing violence, you know, against people for, for, for that. So that seems really a topsy turvy. Yeah. So this is a bit of a tangent. What, what, what race are you? So my dad, uh, my dad is, uh, is, uh, he was born in Trinidad. Um, okay. Off, Caribbean. Yeah. Off the coast of Venezuela. Um, and uh, his background is a mixture. So he's uh, part Indian, part black and part uh, Caucasian. And my By Indian, mom, do you mean? Like East India, like uh, India, yeah. India. Yeah. Um, and then my, my mom's, my mom's uh, white. She's Scott, uh, her background is Scottish, Irish. Fascinating. So you're a person of color. I, I, I am a person of color, yeah. Congratulations, man. Thanks. They, uh, they asked me that when I apply for jobs, are you a person of color? <laughs> yeah. Cause it's important. They have to meet I, the quotas. You know what I say? I put no. You're passable. I know it's, that's true. If the I light's just, bright enough in the room, you certainly look white. Yeah, I just am not. Guy. It's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's where I, that's why I wear the black hat. It makes me look uh, more, uh, more white. Okay. But the, the shirt makes you look darker. That's true. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I don't like, I, I really, uh, I really don't like a lot of that junk person of color garbage. I, there's a lot of. Um, Neither do people of color. <laughs> well, actually, yeah. I mean, I, um, so I, I, I did, I did experience some racism when I was, when I was younger. Uh, Let's hear about it. So, um, so my dad is, is fairly dark skinned, as you might imagine. Um, I don't know that I would call him black, but he's got a fairly dark complexion. And my mom uh, is white. Um, and I grew up in a really small rural area of BC. And my mom was a school teacher at the local elementary school. Uh, and so I think that there, I think there was a bit of a stigma or uh, that was a scandalous in some way to some people. Uh, you know, she's a white woman, black man, or whatever, mm. they, whatever they thought. Um, and the, you know, the children were whatever. So, um, that, that kind of washed, washed over to some extent, I think. Um, and moreover, you know, I saw, I saw, I saw my dad had, had like, he had to deal with that. And so, for example, like he, uh, he had, uh, he, he was a pilot. He was trying to be a pilot when he was younger. Um, and he still has his pilot's license actually, but uh, he would do interviews and he would have jobs promised him and then he'd go and they'd see him and they'd just like slam it. He literally had a door slammed in his face once. And so um, that has a really profound impact on people, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, it, it, I think uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to have, like it's, it's challenging dealing with that. And I was sort of lucky in a way because I kind of, I kind of, I kind of got exposed to that at a young age and started wrapping my my mind around it and figuring it out. Um, and I think it's sort of really been a blessing in in a lot of ways because it's sort of uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of covert you know it's not just racism that's overt it's a lot of covert stuff that happens too, and. I think you like you can really sort of spot it a bit easier, maybe. Um, so I would. You're talking about covert racism. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I I'm just talking about some of the woke stuff and how how you get some of these people that you know talk about how they're they're against racism and they're they're not one of the bad white people and things like that. Like it's it's it looks quite absurd, and uh, 
the 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 sort of the kind of um, it, it has that same quality to it, and uh, and so in in many cases, and so it, it always looks a little bit peculiar to me, and it looks a little bit like it's okay, you've, you found like a you found like a new pro, like playground in which it's sort of socially acceptable like socially respectable to be sort of recreationally against racism. Uh, but what you're really doing is it's really kind of the same bigotry. Um, um, and so I, I guess, uh, but I, I still get the lecture from that, you know, you're a person of color, how could you be, how could you be for racism and stuff? It's, it's absurd, but you know, um, as though I'm, as though I am in favor of racism or whatever, it's just, it's absurd dealing with some of these people. Yeah, because it's very black and white for them. Yeah, you know, it's it, and it's it starts with all these narratives of these oppression narratives and, and like, oh, well, I'm I'm gonna do my part to change their experience. And I there's part of me that like I that's really honorable and, and stuff. But um, there's another part that's really it's it really is uh, diminishing of people that like um, you know I don't know that I need. I don't know that I need people to treat me like a some sort of, you know. So I don't need I don't need I don't need a hand up because I'm a person of color. I don't think like I can compete just fine. Yeah, there are yeah there are plenty of people of color who a resent being called a person of color. It's like so you're looking at me purely you know you're categorizing me purely by my skin color. Um. And that's another dream. Oh yeah, that, that's sort of thrust onto people. And then also this implication that you can't be free until white people let you. Yeah, there is there is still that kind of element of uh, of that for sure. Uh, um, it's still, in other words, it's still sort of actualizing the same kind of fundamental, you know, power. There's that word again, dynamics. You could you could describe it as that sort of power dynamic, but it's a new playground for it. You know. It's a new playground, yeah. So even though if I, I convince you you're a victim because you're a person of color, I have disempowered you, and I've actually given myself more power as a within, result. With yeah, within that frame, yeah, you have, yeah. <laughs> and so it once again gets to the how the the, the post colonialists they apply the critique of colonialism post-colonialism to everyone but themselves yeah and it the ideology or the movement is like mass disempowerment yeah, it is. and that's again another instance of let's focus on the problem rather than creating right rather than creating something better let's create a new world it's like they're like no let's dismantle white supremacy how the how are you gonna how the fuck are you gonna do that yeah are you even clear you know you know you've you've you know what white supremacy is and like uh can you pick it out of a crowd so to speak you know like um, well anywhere there's it's their explanation for anywhere there's a disparity racial disparity right yeah 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 exactly no i i know it as like you come that, into a room and there's only like three percent black people well it must mean systemic racism is here and then they ignore like multifactorial analysis yes so that's just the single totalizing factor um yeah it is it is like that um actually the victim mentality i think is like when you when you but where that really grows is where uh self-responsibility is absent like i am responsible for my existence and for my experience in the world like fully when you really believe that I think you're you've gone a long way to sort of leaving behind the victim mentality. That's the and best. It, yeah, and and a lot of this stuff is like, no, no, you're not in control. You're there are these forces that are bigger than you that are just you just you know you were born into this world, uh, and and you know you're oppressed within it, and there's really only so much you can do. And and to the extent that you succeed, you've 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 really succeeded in spite of your 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 own you know, unfortunate or by um, internalizing or, or that, yeah, that's the other thing or, or you internalizing you've, oppression or white supremacy. Yeah. Yeah. You've internalized the whole sold out. Yeah. It's just, it's really quite dysfunctional actually. Um, 
the victim it's it seems like that's becoming a lot bigger in like the personal growth spaces and stuff this notion there's now this notion being circulated that nobody can hurt you Hmm. nobody can hurt outside of maybe physical violence right but like emotional or whatever like nobody can and, and i guess it's based on this recognition that we are divine beings okay you know and if you're a divine being that's having a human experience um nobody can really hurt you they can hurt the conditioned human they can you know the conditioned the ego human mm. that can be in the illusion of being hurt mm. but it's like the what are the wounds you know it's the difference between somebody that gets hurt by an insult and someone that doesn't is that someone who doesn't get hurt isn't identifying with their ego, their reactivity, you know, the, that victim identity. So that seems to be, I mean, that seems to be the most important thing for everybody is to kind of move beyond this victim identity and I see it and, you know, it's true also for um, anti-vaxxers. I'm just going to use that language. It's simpler. Um, and now you've got pro-vaxxers who are feeling victimized by the anti-vaxxers. You know, mm-hmm. and they're like, I won't be, I can't be friends with you and all this stuff. So yeah. we're all just like feeling victimized by each other and everyone else. And a lot of this stuff would just go away if, if, if we were all to wake up from the illusion of disempowerment. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think actually uh, it's kind of a disempowering um, lie almost to say that nobody can hurt me. Um, I, think the, I think where the empowerment comes is yeah, the people can hurt me and I, and they're going and, but, but, um, I will be able to deal with it and I'm, it won't like, like, um, in other words, I, I'll be hurt, but I, I'm going to take responsibility for that. I'm going to deal with it and I'm going to own it as part of my own, like, like experience or existence or whatever. So I think this, the, I don't know, maybe we are divine and all that. All that what stuff. is your, yeah. What is your spiritual orientation? Um, so I'm pretty interested in, uh, in, in spirituality increasingly. Um, I can't claim to be any kind of expert on it. I find some right. Ger- George Gurdjieff, some of his stuff is yeah. pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, here's um, my problem with Gurdjieff. His work is largely inscrutable. Intentionally so. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah, intentionally so. He didn't want it to be turned into a dogma or something. Right. But it also made it extremely difficult to actually practice his work. So a lot of people, so, so people now, this is my opinion that the people who claim to be doing the Gurdjieff work, they're really just doing what some guy thinks is the Gurdjieff work, you know? Mm, Okay. And there are certain elements of it that are clear um, like the fourth way. I don't know if you know, if you're familiar with that categorization. Uh, so, so the three ways, okay. Gurdjieff taught that traditional paths to spiritual enlightenment followed one of three ways. The fakir works in a fakir is Islamic. It's a Sufi. It's a, uh, a Sufi. whose contingency and utter dependence upon God is manifest in everything they do and every breath they take. Poverty, physical poverty, asceticism, who renounces worldly possessions. Fakir works to obtain mastery of the attention, self-mastery through struggles with controlling the physical body involving difficult physical exercises and postures. The monk 
works to attain the same mastery of attention or self-mastery through struggling with or controlling the affections. So the monk is controlling the domain of the heart. This has been emphasized in the West. It's come to be known as the way of faith due to its practice in Catholicism. And then the way of the yogi works to obtain the same attention through struggle with or controlling mental habits and capabilities. So yogi tries to control the mind. Monk tries to control the heart. Fakir, the Muslim version, is tries to control the body. Gurdjieff insisted that these paths um, tend to cultivate certain faculties at the expense of others. So he advocated a fourth way that simultaneously combined work on all three centers rather than focusing on one. Could be followed by ordinary people in everyday life requiring no retirement into the desert. So, okay, this is a, this is a good approach, you know, it's the most integral. So I would say like, that's one of, definitely one of his, although, if you know Oscar Ichazo, Ichazo is credited with sort of uh, something about the Enneagram. He he didn't. He's sort of credited with um, he's one of the fa- he's considered by many to, to be the father of the Enneagram of personality. Hmm. And he had a, um, he just died, I think, in the past year. And he had a, this kind of like war, warrior school, like this spiritual school in uh, Chile called Arica. But um, he, he has this long critique of Gurdjieff that I suggest you check out. And he's, his whole thing is that Gurdjieff basically appropriated, you know, he stole a lot of his stuff and he points to like the ancient Greeks. Now the ancient Greeks had, you know, they, they were integrating the centers, you know, they talked about the different souls and stuff like that. So they were integrating all three centers. So I don't know, maybe even that, maybe even the fourth way is not original, but um, I guess modern approaches to spirituality that include all three centers are usually inspired by Gurdjieff. But again, um, nobody really knows what the Gurdjieff work is other than a few things. Um, well, I, I probably am not one of the, the, the few who, who know it. Certainly um, I have, uh, I have a, I, I, have, I was reading um, I Am That by uh, Nizargadatta Maharaj. Um, and uh, I have The Awakening of Intelligence by um, Jiddu Krishnamurti as well. I haven't read that. I'm going to read that. Um, so there's a lot of people. I've heard a lot of people like Osho. Um, he seems like a pretty interesting guy. Uh, it seems like I, I think the ancient Greeks probably had, were onto a lot of things as well. Um, but I, there's it's not just Gurdjieff though. I mean, I guess there's, there's a lot of people who are writing, who have written on this topic. So. Um. Yeah. So I don't find, I don't find people who do the Gurdjieff work to have much heart development. Hmm. It tends to be, I kind of think of him as like, what do you consider? Will. What do you, okay. Will, what, what do you consider heart development though? Just so that's clear. Heart development is uh well the domain of the heart is like sensitivity and love and kindness and the kind of more christ-like qualities i see christ as you've seen that picture of the you know the heart um it's like this heart of thorns with it's on fire Oh, is it the heart like wrapped in the thorns or whatever? Yeah, it's a heart wrapped in thorns and it's okay. it's on fire and it has this little cross or or it's glowing. It's got fire and a cross on it and it and it's basically his it represents his 
divine love for humanity. So it's really Christianity is more of a, that's, it's called the sacred heart. I see it as a more heart centered spiritual path. And I see the Gurdjieff work as more gut centered. Um, his intention might have been to balance the three centers. Maybe that's something they did back in the day. You know, people that worked with him, I don't know. Um, but he is a gut centered guy. He's a eight on the Enneagram, which is a gut centered type. And so they tend to, you know, you tend to emphasize tend to emphasize the center that you're sort of grounded in. Hmm. So I don't know. I've, I've never met anybody that did the Gurdjieff work that I was like, well, wow, that's an impressive human, you know? And I think, again, that's, that's not to say anything bad about Gurdjieff. Uh, it's more about nobody really knows <laughs> what his work you know nobody really has a sound understanding of his work i think a lot of people are just guessing hmm. but that would probably piss up you know they'd probably be pissed off at me for saying that well actually that's that could be accurate because i i heard the same about him where, where he wrote he wrote it deliberately to, to like you either would understand it or you would not so you have all these like disciples of his and like they're all in disagreement with each other about different things. So, yeah, so. you're kind of just picking, you're picking one and hoping mm. for the best, I guess. Fair enough. So you're, what, what spirituality were you raised with? Um, well, I, I suppose uh, Christianity. I mean, we went, we went to church quite pretty often as kids and then we hated it actually, but, uh, uh, waste of Sunday morning. That's what we thought. But I, you know, I mean, I, it was a good experience on the whole. And so now you're just exploring more. So I don't think, I don't think at that age. It pluralistic. Would, I, yeah, I suppose. I, well, I, um, at that age, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't have been like a, any sort of spiritual exploration right. or anything like yeah. So it was just having to go to church and listen. You know, I, now I could probably get, gain more from it. You know, but um, yeah, I, I I um, let's just say it's an interesting topic, um, which I'd like to learn more about. Um, learning about the Tao Te Ching right now. Uh, that's quite interesting um uh, but yeah there's there's it, there's it's clearly like a huge topic uh you know with a pretty wide range so and i know next to nothing about it so um i see so the work perspective in, work, in, work in progress so the perspective that we're divine beings is kind of out there to you um you're more likely to take maybe a more materialist view or no i don't i wouldn't say it's out there actually um no i feel a certain i i don't know that i would use the word divine at this point but there but there's um no i i would not say i take a materialistic view i, I the thing is that okay so i don't i don't do you believe in a soul? Um, do you believe consciousness is a product of the brain? No, I I would have to say I don't at this point. Consciousness consciousness uh, is a product of the brain. No. Um, maybe not. Maybe not. I, it's that's a really difficult question. Um, um, the the reason I say that the reason I might be inclined to take the no position is that uh, is that um, is is for is for the exactly probably the reason that, that you might expect is that like you can start to see the, the the chatter of the mind as as a process that's not 
do we um, it's just happening, you know? Um, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, tough, tough question. <laughs> Is consciousness innate to the fabric of reality? It's another tough question. I don't know. Well, that's the, that's the supposition of a lot of uh, spiritual traditions. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that their treatment of, of, of consciousness and of the mind and things like that, it's, it, it, um, it's really in that sort of realm of, of, of things like that you just, that you just talked about. I don't know, personally, I mean, it's, uh, I, there are a lot of people that, that say yes, uh, who, again, I respect, I personally, I. Yeah. You ultimately, you need an experience of it in order to validate it. Yeah. You have to go beyond the, you have to experience awareness as beyond the boundaries of the body. And that will start to, that starts to loosen up yeah, the perspective sure. that I am, that consciousness is only in here, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 it could very well be the case. I mean, I, I, there's, there, there are a couple of very minor reasons why I, I, I can suppose that it might be true. Like one that I've already given. Um, but, um, yeah, hard to say. Uh, I'm not. I'm not really the guy that uh, will tell you anything deep on this topic. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. And whether 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 events of late have driven you more towards spiritual. So yeah, I, I would say so. Uh, although I can't put my finger on why. So putting my finger on why is actually really hard. I've thought about that too. Um, and not. It's 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 an arc that I've been on now for more than a few years. Although it's speeding up, although I, and I still can't put my finger on why. Interesting. Yeah, I think we're all got kind of getting disillusioned with the world. And what's the alternative? Spirituality, you know, it's kind of a refuge. Yeah, I think there there was a, a quote that, that someone shared, uh, Herman Hess, I think. Uh, we have to become so alone that we retreat to our innermost self. Uh, I think the I think what's speeding it up is the se is that sense of aloneness, um, hmm. and so that that might be part of it. it. It is hard to put my finger on it though. But that as that as that 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 um... so there's, there's a few dimensions to that to that sense of aloneness. I think. And it's hard to put my finger on exactly what the dimensions are, but there's not just the dimension of feeling alone. There's something, maybe something else. Um, so, yeah. I hear you. All right, man, We're, we are just now approaching two hours. So I think we should wrap it up. Yeah, sounds good. Well, it was an enjoyable chat. I uh, yeah, it was a great chat. Appreciated being here, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk about this more as time goes on. Yeah, all of the topics that we touched on. For sure, man. All right. Ciao for now. Thanks for having me on. Talk to you later, Marshall. Yeah. Bye. Bye.